This is Tech Talk Aborn, episode 303, Super Hot Ice. What? Welcome to Tech Talk with Buona. This technology podcast covers tech news and reviews for the entire week. And now here's your host, me, Buona McCall. Greetings, folks, and welcome to episode 303 of Tech Talk of Buona. Got a great show lined up for you. I hope you guys had a great, great Mother's Day and Mother's Day weekend. And, uh, and I hope you all said hi or called your mother hashtag call your mom as Verizon would say in their ads that they're putting out. Uh, we've got a great show lined up for you. Uh, I hope you guys caught game chat with one of this past Wednesday. It's a good episode. I think still haven't got a chance to record. I still haven't got another chance. Still haven't got a chance to record uh B rants. Another B rants. I got it in the hopper. I may do it tonight after tonight's stream or uh, after tonight's uh, podcast. I should say it's 10 30 PM now. So time is not on my side. Uh, new video up on Elite Dangerous on YouTube. You guys can check that out. I'd appreciate it. All right, let's get to it. Great show lined up for you. Let's go. And for our first story, we're going to talk about the FCC and the aftermath of Hurricane Michael. Uh, this story comes by way of ArsTechnica.com. The FCC says carriers failed Florida after the hurricane, but they're letting them off the hook mobile carriers response to hurricane was so bad that even FCC chairman Ajit Pai, who normally avoids any criticism of the industry has paid to regulate that he's paid to regulate, called it completely unacceptable. According to the article, uh, he called it completely unacceptable in 20, 2018. Uh, the report recommends changes that carriers can make to improve the future hurricane responses. Uh, the, the, outcome of it was that communication was just bad between cell phone carriers and the other people working to restore things the way uh, they should be calling on wireless phone companies and other communication providers and power companies to quickly implement the recommendations contained in the report. Uh, They find a lack of cooperation. The poor level of service several days after landfall by some wireless providers cannot simply be attributed to unforeseeable circumstances specific to those providers, a lack of coordination and cooperation between certain wireless service providers on the other hand, and utilities and debris clearance crews on the other, unnecessarily prolonged critical backhaul repairs and full restoration of functional wireless service. So being a part of a hurricane is, is rough, especially, you know, if, if you've gone through one, you know that Going through it is rough, but the aftermath can be even rougher depending on power, utilities, restoration, whatever, debris, lots of things to get life back to normalcy. And uh, if you are employed, your employer may require you to come in and you may not even have a way to get out of your neighborhood because of debris. So it's a lot of stress, a lot of stress. And uh, mobile wireless carriers these days, because a lot of you... A lot of us <clears throat> don't have landlines. And I think this is kind of a plea. It's kind of a uh, a reason that you should have a, a landline for emergencies like this. But I know I can't budget both uh, a landline and mobile a lot. If I can get rid of my landline completely, I will. But uh, sadly, sadly, my situation calls for uh, landline and mobile. And if I can get rid of one, I, I'd like to. But in emergencies like this, landlines can be can be a better can give you a better uh, outcome sometimes. Sometimes I say sometimes because there's there's cases where mobile comes up before uh, your traditional phone lines. <clears throat> but in my experience, <clears throat> in my experience, it's always been the landlines come up first. Um, but I've only been through a few hurricanes. I haven't been through a lot of them. So hopefully, this will change next time. Uh, let's see. The FCC's Hurricane Michael report serves as another painful reminder to Puerto Ricans <clears throat> of the FCC's inexcusable failure 
to, co- to conduct a comprehensible investigation into the collapse of communication networks on the islands, islands following Hurricane Maria. This is from Free Press uh, Senior Director Joseph Torres. He was talking to ours about this. And uh, the report also shows that carriers have a credible problem. So I don't think... I don't think that the FCC is wrong in this case. I think the report is accurate. But I think there should be more of an urgency put on it. It looks like it's going to be a slap on the wrist. Because they recommend... They, their recommendation is kind of like, eh. The Bureau further concludes that a lack of coordination and cooperation um, themselves inhibited their ability to increase service availability. Some problems appear to not have been comported by the wireless resilience cooperative framework. The voluntary, the voluntary commitment that several nationwide service providers propose and committed to abide by in 2016 specifically appears that some wireless providers uh, demurred from seeking assistance from potential roaming partners and therefore remain inoperable. They didn't want to play ball. Uh, this failure to comply with voluntary commitments meant that tens of thousands of wireless customers had to wait days unnecessarily for their mobile service to be restored. So this this recommendation is that they need to continue this voluntary thing, but they just need to do it right. And I think a lot of us, including myself, want them to you know put some more stipulations on this because voluntary is a very, very loose word. If you're talking about dollars and cents, you're talking about money. A lot of times these these corporate guys, they just go, oh, voluntary. We don't have to do it then. So, yeah, um, it, it's, it's going to be rough. It's going to be rough. And I hope that the next hurricane that happens doesn't have to go through this. I hope all the red tape or the bureaucracy is put under the table that these companies can cooperate a little bit more. I hope the FCC has a stronger arm for failure to to meet certain I guess you could say certain um, guidelines and meet certain uh, to meet certain minimum requirements. Wow, my brain broke there for a second. Just some minimum requirements. Otherwise, there'll be fines, there'll be fees, there'll be things that you have to do uh, in order to get past this. Check it out, guys. Over on Ars Technica, they got the details about the FCC and how wireless carriers failed to perform after Hurricane Michael and they even mentioned Hurricane Maria Hurricane Maria as other examples and for our next story we're going to talk about hackers and Bitcoin hackers stole 41 million dollars worth of Bitcoin from the Binance cryptocurrency exchange this was actually on Reuters and uh, comes by way of Hong Kong hackers stole Bitcoin worth 40 million dollars 41 million dollars from Binance one of the world's largest Cryptocurrency exchanges, the company said on Wednesday, the latest in a string of thefts from cryptocurrency exchanges across the world. They sold 7,000 Bitcoin. That is, that may not sound like a lot on the surface, but 41 million. You can do the math. 7,000 Bitcoin equals 41 million dollars. They use a variety of techniques, including phishing, viruses, and other attacks, according to a post on Binance's website by their chief executive officer. Zhao Shangping. Uh, the post said user funds would not be affected because the company would use a secure asset fund to cover the loss. So it, it comes at a time right now where a lot of people are looking at Bitcoin seriously, more serious than before, especially since Bitcoin has somewhat rebounded from its downfall. It's many ups and downs. And uh, now that JP Morgan and a lot of people, I think Facebook is even getting into cryptocurrency. Now that bigger companies are are integrating it into their into their business model there's a lot more eyes on bitcoin uh as a possible investment platform or, or inv- a possible investment currency uh Zhao said on twitter that other cryptocurrency exchanges including coinbase had blocked deposits from addresses linked to the hack last year 950 million dollars in cryptocurrencies was stolen from cryptocurrency exchanges and infrastructure services such as wallets up to nearly 260% from the previous year. This is nuts. This is nuts. That's almost a billion dollars stolen. And if you've done any kind of cryptocurrency, one of the biggest rules you'll read is that don't 
use and rely on online wallets. You should get an offline wallet, something that is physical and cannot be compromised remotely. No connection to the internet. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> an offline wallet. And this is why if you keep all of your Bitcoin and all your cryptocurrency in one or maybe two locations online, there's an extremely high chance because hackers love Bitcoin. They love cryptocurrencies. Uh, there's a high chance that it could be compromised in more ways than one. Uh, think of it as a bank account. Think of it as a bank account. Keep it safe. Keep it, you know, highly protected. Get a strong password, two factor if possible, because they go after that stuff. It's hard to track. Uh, it's hard for uh, law agencies to prosecute and to investigate due to the nature of Bitcoin. Um, but the blockchain is inherently private. You know, it's anonymous for a lot of these cryptocurrency wallets and, and cryptocurrency exchanges. So be careful if you get into Bitcoin. This stuff is going to keep happening. I don't see it stopping anytime soon. But that doesn't mean you don't have to do it. A lot of people look at this as a reason not to get into Bitcoin. And I don't think that's accurate. I don't think that's accurate. I think Bitcoin can be a safe way to invest. But you just have to be smart about it and not store all your stuff online. Check it out, guys. Reuters.com has the details. Hackers steal $41 million worth of Bitcoin from Binance Cryptocurrency Exchange. Expect more. It's going to happen. And for our next story, we're going to talk about F5 and NGINX or NGINX or I don't know. How you how, how do you how do you how do you pronounce that? Anyway, F5 acquires the popular web server company NGINX or NGINX. And uh, this story over on ZDNet.com kind of discusses what to expect from the deal. If you don't know what NGINX is and how it operates, you may have heard of things like Apache. This is web server software that people employ to to just serve up your websites. If you go to a website, it's probably using some kind of web server. And Nginx has been known as being very fast and somewhat secure. Uh, it is uh, open source as well. I use it on my server, as you've probably seen from my error messages when they pop up. Um, <clears throat> this is a $670 million acquisition, um, according to this article. And uh, F5 is best known for their high-end enterprise internet service providers out there. Um, so what should we expect from this? Honestly, per I don't know. I don't know how F5, I was going to say N5, I don't know how F5 is going to going to take this. And I don't know where they're going to take this because it looks like they're just, they're just getting on board something or, or using something to, to compete against the Apache HTTP server, which is the big dog that everybody knows of. Um, but Nginx is, is definitely gaining ground, if you, if you ask me. I don't have my ear to the ground as to this web server distribution numbers, but I imagine Nginx still has a lot of numbers out there. Um, this is what the article says. Let's make one thing clear immediately. While a speedy web server is all well and good, this deal is not about web servers per se, nor is it about what we had long seen as a rivalry between Nginx and the Apache HTTP server. No, Frank Francois Loco de Noy, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, F5 CEO explained ahead of the deal's completion that the two companies will be about <coughs> will be about providing DevOps for cloud networking. Specifically, the pair will bring together the modern open source applications developed in and for the cloud for the traditional mission critical applications that are often last to migrate out of the enterprise data center. So when I read that, my initial response was, well, how's it going to affect companies like DigitalOcean and uh, gosh, DigitalOcean is who I use. So I'm like, how's it going to affect DigitalOcean? Uh, they have <clears throat> some packages out there for Nginx and, and Apache. Uh, hopefully it doesn't shun those guys or hopefully there's nothing crafted in this, in this deal to make things harder for competition. Uh, the CEO, Nginx's CEO, kind of assures us that they're going to stick to their guns. He said, F5 is committed to the Nginx open source technology, developers and community. That's all the quote says. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm always skeptical when it comes to these deals because you don't know outside of the boardroom, outside the meeting room, what their true intentions are until they happen. 
They'll promise nothing's going to change, but it always ends up changing somewhat. So as for Injinx's commercial products, he said uh, this is what Robertson had to say. They said they're going to be infusing F5 security capabilities into Nginx products. They're going to be extending the Nginx controller with additional control plane functionality to manage lightweight application delivery controllers, ADCs, and load balancers. They're going to be enhancing the Nginx controller API management module, and they're going to be accelerating the development of a new Nginx controller server mesh module for microservices and Kubernetes capabilities. It's the first time I'm saying that word. I got to look that up. When you put it all together, you see two joining forces to create an open source based high end network application services for today's cloud IT world. That sounds like some 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 PR speak to me, doesn't it? <laughs> but either way, either way, I think this is good for Nginx, but I don't know if it's good for us yet. So we'll be watching this one closely because when you get acquired, you know, that's financial. That's some that's some financial backing. That's some financial guarantees. Uh, I don't know how Nginx was doing before this deal, but it could be a bad thing. It also could be, I mean, it could be a good thing, but it also could be a bad thing, depending on how they're going to restructure and reorg organizations, because you know that always happens. When a company buys out another, there's some, there's some, there's some gaps, and there's also some overlaps, and the overlaps usually was where the changes and the layoffs come. Um, so let's hope a lot of people don't lose their jobs in this acquisition. Check it out, guys. Over on ZDNet.com, they got the details. F5 Networks has acquired Nginx. Let's see how it pans out in the future. And for our final story, we're going to talk about an article on TechTimes.com. And uh, it, it made me raise an eyebrow because I was like, science? Scientists flash freeze water to create super ionic ice half as hot as the sun. So when you read <laughs> when you read that headline, it's just like, okay, we got some hot ice that just happens to be as hot, half as hot as the sun. Um, I, I I don't even know where to start. It says for the first time in history, scientists are able to generate hot super ionic ice that's unlike any type of ice on Earth. This is ice that people have gotten from or that scientists have discovered may exist on Uranus and Neptune. Um in a paper published by the journal Nature, scientists explains they explain how they use giant lasers to flash freeze water and produce superionic ice, taking a snapshot of the rare ice's atomic structure in the process. This is crazy. More than 30 years ago, they predicted that the extreme pressures and temperatures of watery giant planets such as Uranus and Neptune could turn water into superionic ice, which is a bizarre state of matter consisting of solid lattice a solid lattice of oxygen and liquid like hydrogen this is the design this is pretty cool right here six giant laser beams generated shock waves of increasing intensity to compress a thin layer of liquid water to extreme pressure and temperature the conditions were very alien 100 to 400 gigapascals which is one to four million times the planet's atmospheric pressure Jeez. and a temperature of 1,600 to 2,800 Celsius, which is 3,000 to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Then to document and observe the atomic structure of the super ionic ice, they shot it with x-rays. Um, this is crazy. Analyzing the data, the team found a previous unknown atomic structure for water ice that they call ICE-18, which is, they got the Roman numerals XVIII, which is 18, right? That's nuts, man. Uh, findings offer potential insight about the internal makeup and evolution of planets like Uranus and Neptune, such as that of super ionic ice. Within Uranus and Neptune had a crystalline lattice, which suggests it doesn't flow like Earth's fluid iron outer core. So we're learning things about the internals of Uranus and Neptune through this discovery. I think it kind of is further enhancing what was found out in the past. It's probably, this is a quote, it's probably better to picture that super ionic ice would flow similarly to the Earth's mantle, which is made of solid rock, yet flows and supports large-scale convective motions on the very long geological timescales. It's a lot of scientific words right there. I'm still, still I'm just still stuck on ice that's that's half as hot as the sun 
That's that's some that's some hot ice. Icy hot. Check it out. <laughs> Check it out, guys. Techtimes.com. That's the details. There's an artist rendering of it as well. I I had to check to see if this is a, a if this was like satire, but apparently it's not. This is pretty interesting. Super ionic ice, half as hot as as the sun. And that concludes Tech Talk with Buona episode 303. I want to thank you for listening to the show. Follow my live stream at Buona.live, which redirects you to twitch.tv slash Buona. Also, if you want to support me and my endeavors, please hit up my Patreon at patreon.com slash Buona, where you can contribute as little as a dollar a month. We also have merchandise at uh, designbyhumans.com slash shop slash Buona. We got a couple t-shirts and some stickers. So go check that out if you can. YouTube.com slash Buona, Twitter.com slash Buona, Instagram.com slash Buona. You can find this podcast and others at Buona.tv slash podcast. This is Tech Talk with Buona. I also produce Game Chat with Buona on Wednesdays. And occasionally, we'll throw in a new podcast that we call B-Rants. I, I produce that on Anchor.fm, which is a mobile-based application that you can just record a podcast on your phone. It's pretty cool. I, I'm overdue to produce another one. And it is definitely coming, definitely coming. I want to invite you all to our 12-year anniversary. We're going to have a 12-year Twitch JTV anniversary on May 22nd, starting at noon. <clears throat> That's a Wednesday. Starting at noon Eastern, uh, celebrating 12 years on the platform. Yes, I'm one of the original Gs, as they call them, the original gamers on Justin TV. You probably know that if you listen to this podcast. Um, but we're going to be celebrating 12 years on the platform. So if you can come by and celebrate with us, that would be pretty awesome. All right, guys, that concludes episode 303, Tech Talk of Buona. I'll see you all next week. Have a great rest of the weekend, morning, Monday morning. I hope you're having a good commute at work or not. <laughs> Have a good day. Bye-bye.